All right, all right, all right. Welcome to another edition of Shabbat Lounge. This is Matt and, and Jake here. Today we're joined with a special guest, and we're excited to be speaking with David Wilbur. And How's it going, guys? David, we are so glad to have you. Those of you that might be listening to David uh, and you've never heard of him, he's an author. He's been around a while. He's a Bible teacher, and uh, he's written several books. One of the books that he's written recently is Remember the Sabbath, and this is pretty recent. Um, when did this book come out, David? Oh, it just came out uh, a few weeks ago. So, so Hot so, off the presses. That's right. Hot off the presses. And <laughs> um, so if we highly recommend that you uh, go out and get this book, especially if you or you might know someone that uh, is kind of new in Torah and maybe they're trying to figure out uh, the Sabbath and how this works and try to explain, you know, maybe trying to explain it to their loved ones or their friends. This, this is a great thing to put in their hands, you know, if you have the ability, go buy it for someone that, um, that might need it. And it's a great resource for you to help you uh, to remember, you know, a kind of uh, maybe some things you studied a long time ago, but maybe forgot. And, um, but what, one of the things I really like about what David did is he cited his sources carefully and his scholarship is impeccable and uh, I really like that he uh, listed a, a, a very pretty lengthy bibliography in the back of the book and, and, uh, and then cites the references on each page. And so a uh, former school teacher, I, I always appreciate people who know how to do those things and do it accurately. So David, um, uh, the, the we uh, what did what did we miss <coughs> in yeah. our intro? That's again? right. What what do people need to know? Uh, I I think you about covered it. Um, I'm well. I'm a I'm a husband and a father. So I, I'm married to a, a beautiful wife and uh, have two kids, uh, five and three. And so they they keep me pretty busy. But yeah, that that's pretty much my life. Yep. Yep. Well, good. Yeah. And uh, and you do spend some time with Psalm 119 Ministries, and uh, you teach mm -hmm. uh, on, and so they can also find you there. And you have a website. Is there anything else you want to tell people about? Uh, yeah, people can reach me at um, davidwilber.com, and it's a W I L B E R, uh, not U R. Um, so I'm I'm not related to Paul Wilbur. That is a question. That is a question I I get asked often, uh, especially in these circles. But yeah, the the different spelling of the last name. But yeah, please uh please reach out to me there at davidwilber.com and uh, have a a bunch of free resources there. Great, great. Well, uh, I would kind of like to know, you know, uh, a little bit about, you know, how did you come up with this book? You know, what, what's the reasoning and the purpose? And, and, you know, how did you think of the idea, hey, I think someone should write a book about the Sabbath? That's kind of going to be my first question, too, is <clears throat> just, yeah, what, mm -hmm. what kind of inspired you to write it? Well, uh, so this, I, I've been wanting to write this book for years, uh, and so this, this book it, is kind of like my baby. I mean, th this is uh, this is the book I've that I've been really wanting to write, and, and I've written several books, um, but before this one. Um, but yeah, this is kind of like I said, this is like my baby. Um, and uh, the reason I'm I'm so passionate about this topic is um, this is kind of the topic that got me into the the Torah movement whatever you want to call that, uh, the, the movement of getting into the roots of our faith, uh, you know, um, studying the Torah, studying the, the Old Testament, seeing uh, which commandments apply to us today, maybe some of those commandments that have largely been neglected or ignored in, in a mainstream Christianity, for lack of a better term. And so the Sabbath it, it seems like such a an obvious one because it's part of the Ten Commandments. Right. You know, every yeah, every Christian agrees that the Ten Commandments, you know, are are foundational. You know, there there may be disagreement on on how they apply, but every Christian would agree, I think, with the with the general statement that the Ten Commandments are foundational to our faith, and so. Well, one of those commandments is the Sabbath. We're specifically commanded to remember the Sabbath. 
And um, ironically, you know, this is the one commandment that seems to have been forgotten. And out of the out of those ten commandments uh, within um, Christianity, generally speaking, and so that was that was kind of the one of those commandments that has uh, that hooked me. That kind of looking into this topic that kind of got me uh, that brought me into this walk uh, of Torah observance and and so. Yeah, I, and David, David, I, I just kind of wanted me. to... When, yeah, yeah, when go ahead. was that? How long ago was that, that you kind of started oh. walking in Torah? Oh, it was over a decade okay. ago. Uh, so, yeah, probably about 12 years ago uh, when I started. I'm, I'm 34 now, so, yeah, that makes, a, that, that makes sense. I think I was around 21, 22 when I started really investigating uh, the question. So, uh, yeah, this book is kind of just taking taking other Christians and other believers along with me on that journey that, that I went on, you know, when I started looking into this topic, you know, because like other Christians, um, when confronted with this question, I, I had many of the same objections that, that a lot of people often think about or, or hear when it comes to the Sabbath, which is like, well, I thought the New Testament teaches that the Sabbath is done away with, you know, that it's, it doesn't apply to us anymore, that, that we rest in Jesus, you know, we, that's, that's how we keep the Sabbath now is by resting in Jesus, his completed work, or, you know, the Sabbath is only a Jewish thing, or the Sabbath was changed to Sunday. So there's a bunch of, um, bunch of typical responses that you often hear when confronted with that question, what do we do with the fourth commandment? What do we, what do we do with the Sabbath? Those are a lot of the ideas that typically come up. And I had a lot of those assumptions. And so the book is basically challenging all of those assumptions uh, that, that I had and, and bringing, bringing other believers along with me on that journey of, okay, what does the Bible really say? Let, let's, let's put aside our assumptions, let's, and let's try to examine the scriptures uh, with a clean slate, if you will. What does, what does the, the subtitle of the book is what the New Testament says about Sabbath observance for Christians. And so trying to examine, um, really, with a clean slate, uh, what the New Testament actually says. Because we all agree what the Old Testament says. You know, the, the Old Testament says that we should keep the Sabbath. Does the New Testament agree with the Old Testament? And so that's, a, you know, I, I, I believe it does. I believe the New Testament agrees with the Old Testament that yeah, the Sabbath is still, yeah, the Sabbath is still for us yeah. today. So, yeah, I hope that answers yeah, your I question. I think it's a, a good place to start. I think most people that I've heard of do start there. And for the exact mm -hmm. reason you're mentioning is it's one of the ten. So, uh, and that's where I started, too. Uh, my wife brought up, hey, uh, let's maybe we should uh, start keeping the Sabbath. And I was like, well, that one I can, I can be down with because it's one of the ten. And just like you're saying, yeah. most people at that point in my walk, most Christians would agree with that. And then as I went on, I realized uh, when I started bringing this up to people, I started seeing all the stories change to, to oh no, you don't even need the ten anymore, you know. So <laughs> yeah, just the nine. Yeah, and <laughs> and not even that. So, cause, so I started hearing like big name people saying that you know even the ten commandments aren't aren't uh, something we really need to be be working towards. So it was just kind of weird, but I didn't hear any of that right. until after. I started walking in Torah, hmm. and people were making these arguments of, well, we could at least keep the 10, right? <laughs> well, well, you said something, and it, recently, this week, it's kind of been on my my brain. I think uh, Yahuwah has kind of led me here to this concept of new wineskins, and I didn't understand that. You know, I was in Christianity for 30-something years of my life, and 
Um, I had read that teaching many times about the old wine skin and new wine skin and kind of scratch my head and go, okay, yeah, I don't know that I really understand that, but okay. But, but, but <laughs> I don't drink wine anyway. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but after walking in this and, and going down this path, you, you totally have to throw away your old wine skins and have a new wine skin to hold this new teach, new teaching. And, uh, and now sure. I get it. I'm like, okay, that's what he's talking about. You know, have to be willing to, to get rid of, you know, that old vessel and, uh, cause it's not going to contain this new thinking. Right. And, um, and, and I think you were talking about that, you know, as you, as you learn these things, you, you, you yeah, your paradigm shifts. Yeah. I, and I, you know, I think that's a good analogy. Um, and you know, this is something that, um, it, a friend and I often kind of, kind of relate it to this is, you know, you, the Protestant Reformation, mm-hmm. right? What was like the the rallying cry of the Protestant Reformation? It was sola scriptura. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, the, the scriptures alone are our final authority. And, um, you know, we, we just, we have so many assumptions about doctrine and about beliefs based on what we grew up with it's just tradition it's just church tradition and assumptions that that we have that that we don't even think to question and so um yeah it it really is being willing to say okay sola scriptura you know like what the scriptures are the final authority we have to try our best to let the scriptures be the authority and and put aside any assumptions we might have and and really um really uh appeal to the scriptures yes yeah and i think uh, more and more especially with the way things are in the world right now it's it's more and more evident that if you want truth there's one place for it (laughs) yeah And it seems to be really hard today to find truth, doesn't it? It does. We can't trust anything we see, anything we hear, anything we read. You know, as, as a school teacher, that's one of the things that, that I always taught my students, you know, that you look at multiple sources and uh, you question and you ask, you know, who's saying this? Why are they saying that? What's their motivation? Right. And, and you know, and a lot of people don't do not do that. And But, but, but we can't change that, but... but, but the beautiful thing about God's word is it it's still true and the world may be falling apart around yeah. us but his word is still true right yeah it's all, all about all about verifying the facts yeah. and yeah. you know like uh, I, I mean don't just believe something and I have a lot of respect for Christian scholarship like don't get me mm-hmm. wrong like I you know I, I cite that you know numerous yeah. Christian yeah. scholars and and quote you know quote Christian scholars throughout the book uh, even but yeah I um you know, we have to verify the information. Don't just take somebody's word for it, uh, but just we have to verify it on our own and, and uphold the scriptures. Yep. Well, I was going to ask you on page 26 of your book, Remember the Sabbath, you, you quote Acts 15, 19, 19 through 20 here. And, and as, I wrote, as I read through this, I wrote in the margin, I wrote milk. And so, um, you know, I grew up in a church tradition that always talked about going back to the uh, the milk of the teaching, and which was kind of ironic because they were usually talking about people who had been in the faith 30, 40 years, and they kept wanting to go back to the milk. And even as a kid, I'm like, I don't understand. What do you need meat? (laughs) Shouldn't you be past the milk? But anyway, I I don't know. Do you think that's accurate to say in Acts 15, 19? 19 through 20 this was kind of introductory milk teaching for these pagans coming into the faith i i think that's that might be a good way of putting it um i think that uh the the issue in Matt, in acts 15 and and this is a a passage that is often misunderstood uh in in matthew 15 um uh, specifically verses 19 through 20, uh, like you cited, that is usually brought up to say, this is all Gentile Christians need to worry about. Which is funny to me, because um, that is the yeah. argument. And then you look at them, three of the four are food laws. 
<laughs> right, <laughs> right, exactly. And, and so it, it's, um, yeah, it's obviously not a comprehensive list of, of what is required of Gentile believers. Uh, the, the issue that, that's being addressed in Acts 15 is, okay, what do these Gentile believers who, who are coming to faith in the Messiah, what's required of them, um, you know, to be included in the community? That is the issue. Like, how can we include all of these, you know, former pagan Gentiles into the community without causing a bunch of issues? And the, the solution is what James gives. He's like, therefore, my judgment is this. You know, don't, don't uh, bother them with all of this other stuff. They're going to learn that, as we see in verse 21, they're going to learn that every Sabbath as they attend the synagogue services. Um, these are the, these four things are what they need to do um, to be part of the community, so that they don't, you know, so they don't cause issues with the Jews that, that are part of the community. And when you when you investigate the four things that are mentioned, um, like uh, ab abstaining from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood, um, first of all, these are all based on Torah commandments. Uh, second of all. Um, these are um, connected to pagan idolatry. So what is, basically, th these are like things that are connected to a, a cult um, temple, like pagan cult temple worship practices. Um, and basically saying you have to demonstrate that you are completely devoted to the God of Israel. You are completely devoted to this faith and that you have completely renounced pagan idolatry right, those are signs if you of like divorcing their other their other exactly 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 it would be like if a um you know if, if a prostitute today like if a prostitute came into you know the church uh they'd be like okay you can be part of our community but you have to you have to you know quit the that um that you know that that yeah. industry or, or a porn star you know would be a better would be a better example like if a porn star which i guess porn is basically is prostitution except it's you know behind a screen but uh, you get you get right. my point but yeah like if a porn star came in to the church and, and gets saved you know you'd say okay you need to quit the porn industry stop making porn videos stop you know like um like that is like the first step to say like hey you you're leaving that pagan lifestyle behind, and you are fully dedicated to the God of Israel. And, and that's what's going on here. This is not a comprehensive list of, of do's and don'ts for the Gentiles. That's addressed in verse 21, where, where it's like, you guys will learn the rest every Sabbath. Moses is taught in every synagogue every Sabbath. And so, um, yeah, but but for being part of the community, uh, these are things that you need to, to yeah, do first. Yeah, that's a great point. And also, you know, just the whole point that this is a letter that Paul, which is a guy, wrote mm -hmm. to a particular group of people at a particular time. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. for, for the things that they were dealing with in that situation. So um, I think people forget that, too. That, uh, you, you know, and... Um, but... The, the other thing that I wrote down is this, this concept. So recently, you know, uh, as you probably know, sometimes we get some heat for our beliefs in, in the world of social media, mm -hmm. and people have t called us synagogue of Satan. They called us all kinds of crazy <laughs> things. And, um, you know, it, 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 it's easy to get upset, but, uh, but I've learned that, that I can't get upset by these things. And, uh, but anyway, somebody said that, T tried to tell me that Paul had just the only reason he was part of the synagogues because actually on page 27 you talk about Paul being in the synagogue and uh, mm -hmm. that the only reason Paul went to these synagogues is so he could potentially re reach the lost Jews that were there and I was like what? <laughs> right <laughs> I don't even understand what right, you're yeah. saying wasn't it, yeah, for one wasn't he the uh, uh, the Apostle to the Gentiles. <laughs> That's what everybody says. Yeah. You know? So anyway. not that he didn't talk with the the Jews, but I mean that wasn't his main his main deal. And then <laughs> wouldn't that? Uh, I'll have you comment on this. Wouldn't that make Paul a hypocrite? 
Well, I mean, it. I think it would be um, kind of disingenuous, you know, to you know to to o- to only go to synagogue services, you know, for you know for the sake of. Uh, you know, converting Jews, and but 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 I think it. I I think that uh, option is just um, unreasonable to begin with. I mean, uh, Acts seventeen says that it was his custom to go, and these these were Jews, so I mean they they were already attending synagogue. We we know that they were uh, throughout the book of Acts. They were attending temple services. Um, we read that in in Acts three. You know that they were. Um, they were already attend. Um, they they were continuing to attend temple services and things like that. So I, I think that um, the I, I I guess I would put it this way. I, I think in order to come to that conclusion that Paul was simply trying to um, evangelize Jews, like that was his only motive for attending synagogue services to worship on the Sabbath. Um, I, I think in order to come to that conclusion, you have to already assume that Paul considered himself separate from Judaism, that he was a, an apostle of an entirely different religion. And that's simply not the case. Throughout the book of Acts, and even in his epistles, Paul continues to say, you know, that he's, you know, he continues to appeal to his Jewishness, that, you know, um, that he studied, studied under Gamaliel, particularly in Acts. Yeah. You know, he, he says, uh, even toward the very end of Acts, you know, he's talking to Jewish leaders in Rome and it's saying, like, I've never said anything that would offend the Jews or their customs. And, and so he's, um, you know, he's, he's a Jew, the apostles are Jewish, oh, right. like that. You know that. In in order to come to that conclusion, you have to assume that they did not consider themselves part of Judaism. Like they attended synagogue services on the Sabbath because they were Jews. That's what they did. You know they they were faithful to the Sabbath. And and uh, I, I would add another point to that. Um, in Acts sixteen. Um, it says that there, there was they weren't able to even find a synagogue, and so they went to the riverside right. to, pr- to to pray because it was the Sabbath, and, and so um, r- that right there indicates that going to the synagogue on the Sabbath was was more than just an an, an evangelistic opportunity; it was part of their worship. You know, and so because in Max 15, they didn't even find a synagogue, but they still had to keep the Sabbath. They still wanted to observe the Sabbath. And so they found a riverside to, to pray at. Yeah. Uh, they found a spot to pray is what it right. says. Yeah, that's a great point. And so and you talked mm-hmm. about how there's a lot of evidence that the early church uh, did meet on the Sabbath. So, so if somebody wanted to look mm-hmm. that up and wanted to kind of verify, where would be a good place for them? I mean, besides Googling, but we know <laughs> that when you do that, you get all kinds of things. But do you have mm-hmm. a good source about church history or something you could point someone to? Uh, yeah, get my book. Yeah, there yeah. You go. It, it's all. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Uh, I'm. I mean, I'm. Yeah, I'm. I'm actually serious. I'm not. Tr- not just trying to sell a book, but. Uh, but I wrote the book for that reason is, is to be able to document this for people, and uh, particularly in uh, chapter three. Um, this is uh, Christ- like the entire Christian world. Uh, outside of Alexandria and Rome, I, I'll, I'll put it this way: almost the entire Christian world that we, according to historical sources, outside of Alexandria and Rome, continue to keep the Sabbath. We know from at least two fifth-century church historians that uh, almost the entire Christian world were continuing to keep the Sabbath. We know from uh, fourth century Christian sources, like the Apostolic Constitu- uh, Constitutions, uh, Epiphanius, um, the, uh, the Pseudo Ignatius um, letter to Magnesians, that uh, these are all fourth century documents that all indicate that uh, Christians were continuing to keep the Sabbath. And, uh, and Socrates, Scholasticus, and Sozomen are the, the 5th century uh, historians that, that uh, mention this. So it, it's really, um, this is what Christians even continue to do, even 
after the time of the apostles. It's really um, only within uh, Alexandria and Rome that we have early sources of Christians uh, beginning to abandon the Sabbath and, and observing Sunday exclusively. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, it, it's only after the time of Constantine, really, that we have uh, sources indicating, way after Constantine, that we have sources indicating that, that uh, Sunday kind of started to replace the Sabbath as, uh, replace the, the seventh day as a, as a type yeah, of Sabbath. Yeah. And that, there's so. that one quote that I've always referenced where, a, um, a Catholic bishop, and there's a there's a newspaper article where someone quoted a Catholic bishop saying that the that Sunday was the mark uh, for the Catholic Church, and you know that mm. that one always stood out to me, uh, and that to me is a pretty good proof text of uh, that even in in some of their writings they admit that this is that's their mark. This is their mark, yeah. Right, and, and if you submit to that, you're you're under that mark, which is interesting. Right, but, and then... Uh, but I was just going to read for the people that aren't familiar with the book. Chapter 3 is called Answering Objections, Sunday Has Replaced the Sabbath. And, and I just want to support what David said. He did carefully on the bottom of each page. He tells you the verses. He tells you... He lists the author's name, the title... Uh, where it came from, and so if you, it is a great re reference. And he spent hours. You can tell he spent hours and hours gathering these resources and collecting this information in one spot. So, you know, it's uh, it's it's it definitely that's why we're talking to him. You know, it's a must-have book. <laughs> it puts everything right in your fingertips and and in one place shows all these sources. So. Yeah, it's a great resource, and I especially like how. Um, like you were saying at the beginning, how you do go to the New Testament about it, because that's really where the objection mm -hmm. is. And then, uh, mm -hmm. and not just what I what else I also like about it is it's not it is it is answering the Sabbath. That's the that's the high level uh, thing you're addressing here. But it's also all kinds mm -hmm. of other things that that come up, uh, other objections from different verses that people might throw at you. Those. Uh, uh, there's some apologetics on those verses as well, which make it uh, real yeah. handy. Um, yeah, for instance, you know, when you start studying out Galatians and Colossians and you start looking at those mm. people groups, who they are, and I think that's one of the problems. I was actually talking to my brother recently about this, and and uh, he he's coming from a traditional, he was a, a pastor, um, and coming from that kind of perspective, and um, and mm -hmm. just talking about how we, we've been so guilty of pulling these verses out of context. And, and if you don't understand who the people are in Galatian, who the Gauls and the Druids and the connections they have there, the, if you don't mm -hmm. understand and do a little background, uh, you don't. You, you, it's very easy to miss some things there. And, and when you start, there's a, there is a common theme between, he uses this word rudiments, or, and which which you wrote in your book, Earth, Wind, and Fire. You know, so there was this worship mm. connected to Earth, Wind, and Fire, and that and, and um, that was pretty common thinking of, of the people of the day. And they did have these ritualistic things that they were doing in pagan re religion that had to do with uh, worshiping these elements. And they had feast days, and they had. Uh, you know, different things that they did and holy days. And, and so uh, if mm -hmm. you don't have that concept, um, it, it can be real confusing. And, and, and I think that's what's happened. People just uh, read those and they, they didn't dive in and in, in look and see what the background. What that really means. Mm -hmm. and, and then today with the Internet and the world we have, you know, there's, there's really no excuse to not to know this information mm -hmm. because you can do a simple Google search and find all about Colossians and, and, and Galatian and, or Colossae and, and what they believed and what they thought and see the ruins and, you know, it, mm -hmm. it tells you the story. Yeah, and you can see right. what, the, and, and even, what the asceticism yeah. is that he's talking about in Colossians. The Hellenistic Greeks, you right. know, that, that thinking. You yeah. Know. Well, well, even even within the text itself, I mean, there, there it, it's clear, ju just a surface reading of the entire chapter right. It's it's clear that there is much more going on there, that he's not he's not just addressing um, people that taught that you should 
keep the Sabbath. He, in verse 8, he says, these are people that teach a vain philosophy. They teach, um, you know, uh, a vain philosophy according to the elemental spirits of the world, you know, like uh, spiritual beings. He, and later well, on well, in the I chapter... every time he yeah. says that word element, elementals it seems like somewhere in one of the translations it uses the word rudiment or rudimentary and mm -hmm. i believe that every time i see that it tricks in my brain you know he's talking about earth wind and fire and people who yeah. worshiped those things because yeah. that was like a real thing that they did well yeah, yes exactly because they believed that there were spirits behind those yes. things they, they believed that there were spirits behind those elements. And, and also, uh, and then later he explicitly says, like, worship of angels. Right. These people worship angels. And, and so, yeah, there are, um, there's much more going on here. They, these were, um, uh, these were uh, the, the false teachers at Colossae. They were, um, they had mixed in certain elements of Judaism with paganism. So it was, um, you know, I, I do think that the the Sabbath, it, it's talking about the, the seventh day Sabbath uh, in verse 16, but it's it's been sort of mixed in with this broader pagan philosophy. Well, and it goes back uh, to what the Torah yeah. talks about is mixing the holy with the profane. And he clearly yeah. says, right, right. don't do that. Right. <laughs> and we don't want to be right. any part of mixing the two together. Right, it, yeah, and, and the, what these pagans did is, is they, they basically believe, they, they basically said, like, okay, observe these things uh, in order to influence these elemental spirits, in order to influence these, uh, the, these spirits behind, you know, the, the elements, behind uh, the, the seasons and things like that. Um, and, uh, and so Paul is saying, don't let those people judge you. You know, he's saying he's not condemning the Sabbath and the feast days and all of those those things, uh, you know, themselves, because the Bible teaches those things. He's saying, don't let these false teachers who worship angels, who do all of these things to try to appease the elemental spirits, don't let these people judge you on how you keep these things. Because, you know, they, they're false teachers. They, they're not even keeping Torah. They're keeping a distorted form of Torah, which is no Torah at all. It, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a false religion. So Yeah, yeah and we're, yeah, we're going to be doing a, a, a study on mm -hmm. Colossians here coming up pretty soon, actually. And there's, there's a lot in nice. there. Yeah, yeah and, and I think it's one of those things, too, where Paul would come back if we could talk to him today and be like, he would say, hey, you did what with my words? <laughs> you said that I said that? <laughs> Wait a minute. I, I, I think he would be upset with some of the things that, some of the words that we put in his mouth and attributed to him, it would be very upsetting mm. to him. Right. Um, and I just wanted to get back to what you were talking about on the, uh, uh, the Sabbath in chapter three there with the uh, knowing the, uh, that it continued on uh, even after mm -hmm. the, the first, you know, the first century apostles and stuff. Um, and mm -hmm. how uh, there was, uh, there, cause there's always a question of, well, how do you know that, you know, what we call Saturday today was the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so, I, I know of, I don't remember who it was, you might remember, David, but um, there's someone who, uh, in their writings, they said uh, the Jews keep the day of Saturn, which is when they were mm -hmm. coming up with Saturn's day, right? Which is why it's called mm -hmm. Saturn, Saturday. And so, the, I don't know if you've heard that. Well, uh so, so is the question like how do how do we know that the Sabbath we observe today, Friday night to Saturday night, that that's the seventh right, day right. of the Bible? Right. Okay. Well, it, yeah, it's uh, we we do know uh, for sure uh, from the Bible um, that there, there's numerous passages that that demonstrate that biblical days are evening to right. evening. Uh, we know this from the very uh, you know first few verses of Genesis, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. So, uh, and also, you know, like Yom Kippur, it explicitly says that it it's, uh, begins at sundown. It goes from sundown to sundown. Um, we know historically 
that uh, Jose- from Josephus that uh, days were marked, uh, and, and this is this is first century, so this would it would have been uh, you know shortly after the time Yeshu- of Yeshua. Um, that uh, days were marked evening to evening. Uh, we know this in Jewish uh, his uh, Josephus's work, Jewish Wars four uh, nine twelve. Uh, Josephus talks about at the um, you know uh, priests would sound the trumpet at the beginning of every seventh day, the Sabbath, and he would and they would explicitly sound the trumpet at the evening, right. and then they would also sound the trumpet the next evening when the day was finished in order to notify people uh, of the time of the Sabbath when they needed to stop working and when they when they could start working again. Um, the Mishnah, which is um, it's rabbinic writing, but but the Mishnah is uh, pretty early. Um, it also documents uh, the Sabbath being from Friday uh, sundown to Saturday sundown explicitly. Right. Um, in addition to that, we have Roman sources um, from uh, early periods. We have, we have Roman historical sources dating all the way from AD 70 to AD uh, 229 that consistently identify the Jewish day of rest. They, they call it the Jewish day right. of rest. Uh, and they, um, they correlate that to their quote unquote day of Saturn, right, right. Uh, which, which we know today as Saturday. And so um, I, I do uh, in, in my book, uh, there's, there's a chapter, uh, chapter five, which is basically just an FAQ. Uh, frequently asked questions, and, and one of the questions that I address is, how do we know that the Sabbath is from Friday evening to Saturday evening? And so I document all of the, the sources in, in that part of the book. But uh, yeah, we know from the Bible to Josephus to even Roman sources that, um, you know, uh, from the earliest centuries that uh, that, that is the seventh day, no, that, that yeah you know, Yeshua would have yeah, kept. Yeah, that's fantastic. And that is something you have to mm-hmm. r- run down when you start going down this path and kind of have to investigate. And and, and, and I mm-hmm. did it and came to the same conclusions that you, you mentioned. And um, one of the other mm-hmm. things that we chased was the calendar. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. so there's, oh, man. there's been so much debate about <laughs> that, about the lunar calendar. I mean, just all these things. And, and uh, I came to the conclusion just exactly what you said, that if these mm-hmm. things were so crazy far off, that when Yeshua was on this earth, he would have corrected the Sabbath if it was the wrong day. He, you, there would be a passage Absolutely. where he said, you've heard it said to keep the Sabbath. I'm telling yep. you it's this day. <laughs> you know, he, he doesn't yep. say that, so yep. they were keeping it. And also, he doesn't correct him about the calendar. And so I, I tend to believe that the calendar that they kept then and that, that most traditional Jews keep today is, is probably pretty close to to that calendar mm. he would have corrected that as well if it was if it was way off so right um, yeah that squeaky wheel gets the grease kind of mentality of yeah. what he was attacking at the time yeah and, and that was real comforting to me though you know because we there was so much discord in, in our own group about the calendar and we all stu- we studied this mm-hmm. we had people studying the Zadok priest calendar and all these things oh nice yeah and and i came to the you know we kind of all came to the conclusion together we just had to agree on one and we kind of follow you know basically what monty judah puts out in the lion and the lamb calendar and i feel like that's pretty accurate you know but but i also just came Mm -hmm. to the conclusion at some point you just have to go with something and 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 stay with it because you can't flip flop around because then you know it's it's hard enough to learn these things and figure out what days to ask off at work and and make preparations for yeah. and then if you flip flop every year you, it's just it, our 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 god is not a god of chaos and confusion and so right. you know it just doesn't seem consistent with what he would want us to do so and we decided well we're going to quit arguing about it we're just going to agree <laughs> that we're going to follow this one and it's going to be okay yeah, well, I, I'm. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Really, really glad to hear that because I, I know that that is. Uh, I mean, being in it for for twelve, thirteen years, something like that. Uh, I that's that's always been a source of contention, you know, that I've that I've even encountered, um, you know, here and there. 
uh, in various groups. And, and yeah, it's, uh, I, I think that's the right approach. I mean, we know that, um, the, it, it, it's meant to be, the feast days are meant to be kept in community, you know, they're, they're community events and, um, you know, you, you have to have some sort of standard that you abide by and, uh, and some sort of, uh, yeah, uh, reference yeah. point. Yeah, um, and I think bottom you know, line so. is, you know, the, as I've stole this from Zach Bauer, I think the father looks down and goes, hey, my kids, they're trying to do my stuff and keep my feast. That, that, that's how he sees mm-hmm. it. And just like we would yeah, our own yeah, children uh, when they try to make us, you know, breakfast and burn the toast <laughs> and we eat it yeah. and we smile and go, this is delicious. Um, because it is pleasing yeah. and warms your heart. And, and that's why we have children is so we can understand a little bit of his unconditional love for us. So Right, um, right. Well, Jake, uh, we, we, we don't want to keep David forever. We have a few minutes left here. Is there <laughs> something else you want to bring up before we get off the phone with him? Uh, yeah, just the one thing about, uh, so in, a lot of people use Romans 14, and I know you, you go uh-huh. into pretty good depth on that in the book um, mm-hmm. as a way to, so people use Romans 14 as a way to say, you know, uh, the Sabbath is whatever day you want, and don't pick on people for keeping right. whatever they think. Right. And, and then uh, as part of that, that apologetic on that, that section of Scripture, um, I was just curious if you t- you've seen that tied to First Corinthians eight, or if you tie it to that uh, when uh, in the book. I can't remember if if you go into that in detail or uh, uh-huh. it's, just, it's kind. It, he Paul's kind of using a very similar language, and then in right. the First Corinthians, he's pretty explicit about talking about um, uh, meat meat sacrifice to idols. So I was just right. wondering if you made that connection there. Uh, yeah, I do. I do talk about it a little bit. I, I take a little. It, it's a little bit more nuanced. My my perspective okay. is. I do think there's a. I do think there's a connection. I will say that I do think there's a connection. Uh, and what you're what you're talking about specifically is what Paul is addressing in Romans 14 when he says uh, when he's talking about. Uh, quote unquote unclean foods. So you know, Romans fourteen fourteen, he says nothing is unclean in itself, but it's unclean for those who think it's unclean. Right. So that that translation um, in English is very misleading, exactly. because uh, in yeah in Greek that word is koinos, um, and it's not the same word uh, that is used for uh, unclean animals throughout the the Torah. Uh, the uh, word for unclean animals in the Torah is uh, akathartos. And so koinos is a newer word. Like, it, it's not anywhere in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Um, uh, it does appear, I think, in one place in, like, uh, in like uh, four Maccabees. It, it, but it, it's a very later word. Um, and what it reflects is like an idea of ritual impurity, um, which uh, during this time, Jewish people, um, basically they labeled things ritually impure that were not necessarily um, derived from biblical commandments. Yeah, like part of their oral traditions, maybe. Yes. Yes. So, so like a, th- this word also, this word koinos, it also shows up in Mark seven, when uh, you know Yeshua or, or when the Pharisees say, "Why are your disciples eating with defiled hands?" Right. Um, and uh, basically, they they had not ritually washed yeah, their they hands. Didn't follow the eating. procedure. Yeah. Yes, and, and so that's not in the Torah. Uh, you know that they had to wash their hands before eating, but that was part of the uh, the ritual purity regulations that the Pharisees had developed, and um, and basically what what the Pharisees thought is that if you ate food without washing your hands according to the the ritual procedure that we developed, your hands are koinos; they're ritually impure, and it turn and it makes your food ritually impure by association. And so the the idea that's going on in in Romans fourteen, in my view, is that um, uh, there were a lot of Jews at that time that refused to eat meat, 
And Paul actually makes that explicit in uh, the very beginning of the chapter. He says, you know, there are some of you who eat meat. I think it's verse two. There's some of you who eat meat and there's some of you who eat only vegetables. Right. Mm -hmm. So so the context right away lets us know that this is, this is a uh, discussion or this is a debate among believers regarding um, those who eat meat and those who eat only vegetables. So it's not something, the, the Torah doesn't forbid eating meat. Um, so yeah, there's, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so, the, so right away from the context, it's clear that there's something else going on here. Uh, and when you find out this word koinos, that it's talking about ritual impurity, um, and that is, that it's not based on a biblical commandment, but based on, um, you know, uh, extra biblical, uh, restrictions. Um, right. A lot of a lot of Jews refused to eat meat that would have been purchased from the uh, Roman marketplaces because that meat was associated with Gentiles, and, and so where it where it kind of connects well, and, and to can, the, the meat. And couldn't it even the reason they objected to it because they were afraid that you might have a kosher cut of meat next to an unclean cut of meat, and they they couldn't even right. think about eating that because it might have been next to the pork or next to something sacrificed right, by right. an idol. Yeah. Right, and I think, I e think it was exactly. very, yeah. uh, uh, like in the in the uh, First Corinthians uh, section, I think they're specifically talking about they didn't want to eat meat at the market because they didn't know if it came from the, the pagan right. temple. So that would make it, right. they, even if it was a clean yeah. animal, that would make it koinos. Right, right, right. They didn't know if it was sacrificed to idols yeah. or not, and 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 so there's there's a number of possibilities uh, in in Rome. Like in Rome, um, Jews may have felt may have been concerned that it was offered uh, to an idol, that the meat had been offered to an idol. They may have been concerned that the blood wasn't drained properly. Uh, so there are num there are a number of things that would have caused them not to want to eat it. Uh, let me read this quote really quick. This is a quote from a um, a New Testament scholar. His name is E. P. Sanders, but he addresses this. He says. Um, uh, in his book, Jewish Law, From Jesus to the Mishnah, he says, because of ignorance, general suspicion, or the long-standing association of meat with sacrifice, Jews were reluctant to eat Gentile food, especially meat, just because it was Gentile. The objection, that is, may not have been technical, uh, that is, it has blood in it, but vague and traditional, that is, our family has never eaten Gentile meat. Some Jews would eat Gentile meat if they could receive the right assurances about it. Others simply would not eat it because it was Gentile. So there is, it could have been any number of reasons that, that Jews at, in Rome were not eating meat from the Gentile marketplaces. But uh, this, like, for whatever they consider the meat koinos for whatever reason right. it, it could have been it could have been that they suspected that the meat was offered to idols it could have been just that it comes from the gentile marketplace right. and, I, and who, who who knows what the gentiles done with, exactly. did with it right yeah so so it's um that was the issue and uh basically you know since that's you know Paul is basically saying, like, listen, this is not a reason to divide the fellowship. Right. Like, some some Jews, like, I'm convinced that there is nothing koinos in itself. There's nothing that a Gentile could do, you know, to to that piece of meat that's going that's going to make it koinos. You know, that like, I'm I'm convinced there's nothing koinos in itself. Because like, it's not uh, a thing. But <laughs> yeah, right. But you're, um, but it, it's koinos to those who consider it right. koinos. It is, it, and, and so uh, basically, don't judge each other, um, and you know, try to try to get along. And and basically, if you're a Gentile, it, you know, the Gentiles like those are who he calls strong, like the debate between the strong and the right. weak. If you're strong, don't eat meat. Like, don't don't cause the kingdom, you know, to, uh, you know, don't don't divide the fellowship 
over this issue. It, it's not worth dividing over. And, and that's basically Paul's whole point there, is that, uh, you know, don't don't eat meat around these people if it's going to offend them. No, yeah. That, uh, that, but yeah, he, no, that's yeah. such a great point. And, you know, as you were ri- talking, I wrote down unity. And, you know, that's, that's one of the things that got me where I'm at today. You know, I, I, I helped plant churches. I was involved in ministry. And, you know, it would it always drove me crazy, the lack of unity amongst the believers. And when I came into this walk mm-hmm. of Torah, for the first time I started going, oh, wow, th- this is unity. This is what he wanted when, when he talked about that they, you know, when he prayed that they would be one. This, if we, if more of us did this, we would be one, you know, and, and just, just the simple fact mm-hmm. that every Shabbat, it is absolutely amazing. And I always tell new people, just think, there are millions of people around the world studying the same scripture, reading the same verses, and, 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 mm. and it's impacting them, and they're having the same conversations, they're arguing about the same things we're talking about, and, uh, <laughs> you know, um, the people are all around the world are doing it at the same time, and, and I can remember back, you know, trying to come up with something to preach or talk about, and, and you'd be like, what are we going to talk about? What are we, we going to do? And, and here, like built in. Yeah, I didn't know it. It was there all along. That, that's what we should, you know, just think if, if all the churches caught on to that, you know, and, and, and you know, there, there's just so much power in that unity and and uh, and we can be more unified when we come into torah it does help us do that mm-hmm. amen so anyway i, I know uh, we we don't want to keep you uh, too long and uh, so i don't know jake you have anything else uh, to say or questions or um, comments just uh just that uh, people can go look at go get the book for one and uh, <laughs> uh also read your bible and, uh, and you know all the all the information is there. It's uh, you know we're not we're not uh, told go read your Bible. We're told study the Bible, right? It's, Do it. It's study your Amen. scriptures, yeah. and uh, y- you're not going to gain as much reading it as you are studying it. And uh, um, and then I just wanted to real quick a good place to go on the when you're looking at Koinos versus the Akathartos thing is Acts two. Uh, that makes it pretty clear in the Acts ten. Yes, Acts ten okay. also, but Acts two he says, yeah. uh, and all that believed were together and had all things koinos. So he's not saying he, they had yeah. all things unclean. He's saying they had all things in common. So that's right. a good one to look at too. Uh, but yeah, we just uh, glad you were able to uh, join us and talk about the book, and uh, I'm glad uh, you put it together. Uh, so that uh, people could read it and and kind of break these difficult topics down into bite-sized chunks. Yes, I, I second that. And in this, to those of you listening to this, and you know, if you've got someone in your life, maybe you're walking into it like like some of us for for a long time, and you, but you probably have a son, son-in-law, daughter, uncle, so, somebody in your family. Uh, might be uh, kind of new and exploring this, and this this is a book that they they need in their hands, and this will help them get there probably a little quicker. Um, but it's still one of those things where you give it to them and you say, research it, check it out, uh, study scriptures. Um, you know, because you know this whole thing about work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know, and we we, we want people to think for themselves and and uh, and and. Um, and, and, and not just sit and listen in a pew and just listen to some guy because he's got degrees behind his name and um, the, you know that they that they realize that uh, there's an obligation on you and I the everyday common people to uh, to, to uh, have an understanding and, and, and a conviction about these things and not just accept what someone told us they are right so amen but right. so amen. even yeah when you're when you're reading through David's book, Test what he's saying, and don't just take yeah. it for for granted that he's right. Go research it yourself, and he gives you the <laughs> the tools to go ahead and follow the path that he took to find those answers. 
Yep. Well, David, uh, we, we just want to wish blessings to you and blessing to your family and blessings on this book. And we really appreciate that you did this, that you took this time, that you uh, that you wrote it. And um, so uh, we, we're going to, David and I will continue, and Jake will continue talking for just a minute. But we do want to uh, tell all our listeners, we appreciate you stopping in but to Sabbath Lounge and check out David Wilbur. David, tell us again, where are all the places that we can find you if we want to find something about you. And then uh, tell everyone where they can buy the book also. Yes. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, thank you guys, both of you, so much for having me on your show. Uh, it was a great honor and, and a pleasure to talk to you guys. And uh, yeah, uh, to uh, get more information about the book, I, I bought a URL. It's sabbathbook.com. So very easy to uh, remember, sabbathbook.com. And uh, you guys can um, reach out to me. I'm on all the social media platforms. Uh, just search David Wilbur um, and, and my website, davidwilbur.com. I'm also on 119 Ministries. Um, I work with them, putting out teachings all the time. So, yeah, I'm, I'm out there. Come and find me. I love, would love to connect with you. All right. Well, this comes to the end of our program. And this is Matt and Jake signing off. Okay. <laughs>